there are regular insulin which have been been, been there for many many years another insulin is called the nph which is a, a medium acting insulin now the latest analogs are different which are rapidly acting and very effective produce less side effects less chances of hyperglycemia and they have a good effect on the glycemia on the glycemic control so the rapid onset insulins are lispro aspart and rulisib a long acting insulin are glargin detimid and digladec as far as possible the children should be put on these insulins the dose varies from anywhere between 0.5 to 1.2 units per kg depending on the age of the child the pubertal stage and any evidence of diabetic ketoacidosis so we have to calculate the dose supposing like this child was weighing about 20 kg so we calculate one unit per kg so 20 kg means 20 units in a day as a principle 50% of the calculated total dose is given as long acting so we should give 10 units of glargin insulin once a day the other 10 units can be divided into short acting uh, uh, insulin which is given at meal times so this child was given instead of 10 he was given 8 units of long acting the balanced 12 units were divided into three bolus doses at meal time that is at breakfast lunch and dinner of course we have to do a frequent monitoring every day before the child is given insulin uh, with a glucometer blood sugar levels a uh, blood uh, glucose level should be measured and dose should be adjusted with frequent monitoring so initially you will find it will be difficult to achieve a control but once you achieve a control and the child understand things diet is controlled you will find good uh, glycemic control is achieved so there are various routes of giving insulin you can use injections with the syringe and needles pen like devices with insulin containing cartridges jet injectors and continuous infusion of rapid acting insulin from a pump so if you see this pictures you can see on the left hand side top picture these are the insulin pens from various companies there is the insulin jet injector insulin pump which is attached to the patient and with this monitoring can be done and these are the insulin syringes where with which you can give regular insulin and not of course this pen device pen devices they've got a very thin needle less painful and uh, very used very very uh, by much of the public adults and children also so this is the most frequently used pens but nowadays we have come up with the insulin pumps where i'll come to that later uh, where the body detects what is the blood levels of uh, glucose and accordingly insulin is injected to the patient so where it should be injected there are the various sites upper outer arm abdomen buttocks upper outer thighs it is given subcutaneously deep subcutaneous layer and like showing this child is injecting himself so is given subcutaneously the site should be rotated otherwise complications occur at the to the skin and the subcutaneous tissue at that particular side if you keep on giving again and again at the same time so you have to rotate the site of giving insulin blood glucose monitoring you should maintain blood glucose as near to normal as possible and the parent should be asked to maintain a record of that target is to keep the blood glucose between 5 and 7 millimoles that is between 90 to 130 mg per deciliter before meals and 90 to 50 mg uh, milligram per deciliter before bedtime hba1c which should be done at least 3 to 4 times in a year should be maintained below 7.5 for children and below 7% in adolescents more frequent monitoring would have to be done if the child falls sick or has any lifestyle changes so diet has to be optimized for the child a healthy diet should be given with a high complex carbohydrate a relative low fat content and should be high in fiber the child should be encouraged to do exercise also so before the insulin days the diet was of these children was severely restricted especially in carbohydrates and energy but currently what the doctors the, the diabetologist and american 
Our diabetic association, they advise that we should give a healthy, balanced diet, high in carbohydrates. And the carbohydrates also should be complex carbohydrates in cereal form and fiber and should be low in fat. So ideally, carbohydrates should form 50% of the 55% of the diet, fats 30 to 35%, and proteins 10 to 15%. Fats should also be in the form of polyunsaturated fats mainly, more of vegetable fats than animal fats. Try and avoid animal fats as far as possible. Also, sucrose or any other refined sugar should be limited to even less than 10% or totally avoided. So aim of dietary management is to balance the child's intake with insulin dose and activity and keep blood glucose levels as close to reference ranges as possible. And at the same time, avoiding hypo or hyperglycemia. Activity, there should be no restriction. In fact, activity benefits diabetic patients. One should recognize and treat symptoms of hypoglycemia because symptoms of hypoglycemia, and if the child goes into hypoglycemia, can go into coma, can result in death also. So the parents also should be able to recognize if the child is going into hypoglycemia and if the, uh, the child should also be educated on that. And these children may go into hypoglycemia after the exercise so it'll be better if some snack is given before the child is going in for some exercise. And the insulin dose adjustment may be required for if the child is taking part in competitive sports and rigorous exercises. Also better to give a pre-sleep snack after a child has undergone intensive exercise. But remember, activity should not be restricted. The uh, glaring, the most, uh, I should say, example of uh, type 1 diabetes and an athlete, or I can say a player, is Vaseem Akram. You must have heard of Vaseem Akram, who is a fast bowler, who was a fast bowler in Pakistan. He had a type 1 diabetes, and but you could see that he was one of the best fast bowlers, uh, which the I should say the Pakistan has produced, and we have seen in the world also very good swing bowler. So he used to have diabetes, but he was taking part in competitive sports. So very important to also have a long-term management plan for these children. So a regular follow-up and monitoring is required. Aim should be that the child should grow normally, development should be normal, maintain as normal a home and school life as possible. We should not make the child feel that he's a cripple or he's suffering from a dreadful disease or is having some problem. The, once the child starts taking injections and becomes um, used to it, then you'll find that his school life also becomes important, uh, becomes uh, as normal as possible. One thing more which can be done if uh, what I said earlier that re they require to be given four doses of insulin a day, sometimes to avoid the school time insulin dose, what can be done is they can be given three doses in a day. That is, you give a combination of NPH and regular insulin in the morning and give one at the, a bedtime and a long acting at night. So with this one can be reduced, the school dosages can be reduced, but here the glycemic control achieved would be not as much as what we achieve with the four dosages. So aim is to have good diabetic control, avoid hypoglycemia, prevent long-term complications, target the HbA1c to be less than 7.5% and educate the child and parents. So, a structured examination for these children should be done at least once a year where the growth is assessed. See, look at the injection site, whether there's any problem with the skin at that site. If there is, then you should advise a child to switch that, not to give injection at that particular site. Examine the hands, feet, peripheral pulses for any complication. Look for any peripheral neuropathy and any vascular disease. Evaluate for any other signs of autoimmune diseases. These children also can develop other autoimmune diseases like hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism or celiac disease. So they should be examined and evaluated for other autoimmune disorders also. Blood pressure should be taken regularly, <coughs> sorry, to exclude any hypertension. Children who are above the age of 11 years, a regular retinal examination and urine for microalbuminuria should be done. Uh, the ADA, that is American Diabetic Association, recommends consideration of continuous glucose monitoring, where a subcutaneous sensor is placed in the child. This measures the subcutaneous glucose levels every one to five minutes. If there is hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, there's an alarm and insulin 
which is then uh, injected into the uh, child is controlled accordingly. So the dose may be reduced or increased. But the only problem with this is that uh, the blood levels uh, of glucose do not correspond to the subcutaneous glucose at the same time because it takes some time from the blood glucose level to be same as the subcutaneous level. Subcutaneous level take a little longer as compared to the blood glucose levels. So maybe there may be a time gap of about one to two minutes, but that's okay, that's immaterial.